So today, uh, we are beginning a journey in and through this great book of Ruth. It's been said that the book of Ruth is a horror story that ends up like a Hallmark movie. And yet, I don't want to Jesus juke you this morning and uh, just gloss over the fact that this is a really difficult and dark story. I don't want us to just breeze on by this and say, you know what, it's going to be fine. It's all going to turn out in the end. They'll live happily ever after and everything will be just fine. God always works things for the good of those who love him. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. No, I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over some of the difficult things today as we open this book of Ruth because the reality is we could just jump through and pass over some of these hard parts in the word of God, but the reality is we can't do that in our life. And so why would we just breeze on by some hard things in scripture if we can't do that in our own life? And so I gotta warn you, I gotta tell you right up front from the very beginning, this is gonna be difficult. This is gonna be hard. We're gonna, we're gonna go down to the depths of darkness and grief in this moment and yet we're gonna find that there's even hope there. The great theologian, and uh, many argue, one of the greatest Old Testament scholars of our day, Walter Brueggemann, says this. The prophetic task of the church is to tell the truth in a society that lives in illusion, to grieve in a society that practices denial, to express hope in a society that lives in despair, the book of Ruth is that story of hope in the depth of despair. And if we're gonna be a people of hope, uh, if we're gonna experience hope ourselves, we've got to start by just asking the basic question, what is hope? What is authentic? What's actual? What's genuine, bona fide, the real McCoy? What is actual hope? What's biblical hope? Because you may have had hope in your life. You may at this moment be experiencing hope in your life. Maybe you've wished for something, dreamt for something, had this prayer that you've been praying and hoping for all through your life and yet at the same time never really understood or maybe not even grasped onto what biblical hope really is. The word hope in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, ancient scriptures of the Old Testament, the word hope is the word tikva. Uh, it's the word that means hope. But it also means uh, a cord, something that you attach something else to, that you would tie up to attach to something else. And so when it comes to biblical hope, when it comes to authentic and genuine hope, hope is less of an emotion, something we have in our hearts and more of something that we hold in our hands. Well, Brandon, that sounds good, but did you just get that from Pinterest or is that actual Bible? No, that's actually in the Bible. It's actually from the story of a woman named Rahab, a woman who was a prostitute, a woman who was from the city of Jericho. The Israelites were just about to go into Jericho to conquer and take over this city of Jericho when they met this woman, Rahab. They met her and uh, greatly benefited from this friendship with her, not in a sense of prostitution, thank God, but in a sense of hospitality and welcome. Rahab welcomed the Israelite spies who were coming in to check out the land of Jericho, and because of her hospitality and kindness to them, they extended an offer to her. Hey, we're about to come in and kick butt and take names. And when we come in, we're coming in with the Lord on our side. And so if you and your family want to be protected and want to be spared, then what you need to do is actually drape a scarlet rope out of your window so we don't kill you and the rest of your family. And so logically, that's exactly what Rahab did. Rahab hung out of her window this scarlet cord and her life was spared. Do you know what's interesting about uh, the Hebrew word for the scarlet 
cord that she hung out of her window is actually the word tikva, the same word for hope. So literally Rahab in this moment was holding out hope in her very hands. You see, for us to get a grasp on what biblical hope is, we've got to understand that it's less of an emotion in our heart and more of something we can actually hold on to in our hands. This idea of expectation, this idea of active energy of expectation. It's not passive. I hope everything works out at some point. No, it's an active hope that we can grab a hold of. The things that we're hopeful of and this idea of biblical hope is actually, God, we want to connect our lives. We want to wrap our lives so much around you that we are corded to you in hope. Now, we get a chance to see practically what this biblical hope looks like today in our story through two women, one an Israelite and the other a Moabite. So if you've got your Bibles with you, turn over to Ruth chapter one. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, that's okay. Just share with a friend. If you don't have any friends, you can join me. I'm with you in that. We can be friends and we can both love tacos and get tacos together. Ruth chapter one, verse one says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Now pause, this is setting the scene, setting the context. We gotta dig into a little bit of history here so that we can understand more fully the story that we're walking through over this next four weeks. The story begins in the period of the judges. This was a period of great difficulty. It was a period that we already see includes famine, fear, injustice, darkness, depression. It was a time of lawlessness and covenantal faithlessness. Everybody in this moment was living as if whatever God said didn't apply to their life because they weren't listening in that moment anyway. This was the dark realities of life in a fallen world on display. It was complete chaos. What would happen was the Israelites would turn away from the living God and they would instead turn to the gods of the Moabites. These gods included gods like Baal, the god of rain, and Ashereths, the god of fertility. And when they would turn, God would abandon them and let them be overcome and overtaken by their enemies. And so what would they do? They would, uh, they would be oppressed. They would be frustrated. They would be uh, complete martyrs in that moment. And so they'd cry out to God. God, would you please save us? Would you please help us? Would you please rescue us? All of these people are picking on us. And so God in the book of Judges all through that point in history would raise up, surprisingly, a judge. But don't think of judges in scripture like you do of Judge Judy. This was a different kind of judge. In the the judges, in the time of the judges, they were more like a military leader that God would raise up to go to war against their enemies and conquer all of the enemy forces. You may have heard of some of the judges like Gideon or like Samson. And there was a female judge who, let me just tell you, kicked butt and took names, named Deborah. And so this was the time in the midst of all of this chaos, all of this difficulty that we pick up the story of Ruth. And the story goes that in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. Their names in Hebrew mean sickness and death. Uh, In other words, almost dead and already dead. Spoiler alert, they're both going to be dead by the end of this. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. Didn't even prepare us for this. The death has already happened. It's already hit us, and we're just 
three verses in, they've doubled down. There's a famine. There's darkness and difficulty. There's, there's sickness. There's uh, everyone's leaving their own country. And now Naomi's husband is dead, and she was left with her two sons. Verse 4, these two took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there in Moab about 10 years, and both Malone and Chilion died, so that the, the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Pretty dark. And we're just getting started. This is complete and sheer terror for this woman. A traumatized woman in a cataclysmic crisis. Can you just, can you imagine the maternal agony of losing your only two kids? Let alone losing her husband. She lost everything. And in that society, in that culture, where the men were protection and provision, all that was left were her two daughters-in-law. And then eventually, one of them ended up leaving her too. This is abject destitution for Naomi. This is how the story begins. And we're gonna gonna descend even further into the darkness of this story. Just when you think it can't get any worse, we've gotta understand the relationship between the Israelites and the Moabites. Because there's two Moabite women in the story, Orpah, and Ruth, and if I had to explain the relationship between the Moabites and the Israelites, I could do it in two words, and those two words are Jerry Springer. You chuckle because you never thought you'd heard Jerry Springer in church before, but this is kind of the relationship between the Moabites and the Israelites. And to understand this further, you've got to go all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 19, when we meet Abraham and his nephew, Lot. Lot and his two daughters lived in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed by God because of their despicable, disgusting sin that is a bit unmentionable amongst mixed company. Uh, So God destroys and wipes out everyone except Lot and his two daughters. And so... They decide to live in a cave, and Lot's two daughters got a little worried. Hey, there may not be any other men to carry on our family name. And so Lot's daughters decided it was in their best interest to get their father drunk so that they could sleep with him and so that they could get pregnant. And no, this is not actually the real housewives of West Virginia. This is in the Bible. And so they sleep with their father get pregnant, and his oldest daughter, Lot's oldest daughter, gives birth to a son who they name Moab, who became the father of the Moabites. The story of the Moabites begins in a story of incest and disgust. The story goes on and carries on as that nation and as that people group grows and Uh, The story continues all the way into the book of Numbers. For three chapters, we see that the Moabites begin to understand and begin to wrap their minds around this idea that God is on the side of the Israelites. And that wherever the Israelites go, God is with them. And what that means for them is that they could get conquered very easily by the Israelites. And so what happens if you can't beat them? You join them. That's what USC is doing with the Big Ten. So that's, it's happening in the Bible times too. If you can't beat them, join them. But then after just one chapter, things start to turn in Numbers chapter 25 when if you look at the title of the, the, the heading on the chapter, it says that the Moabites seduce the Israelites. So it moves from if you can't beat them, join them to if you can't beat them, sleep with them. And so, as you can see, there's quite a a, a saucy and spicy relationship between the Israelites and the Moabites until you fast forward to uh, this book with all of God's laws wrapped up in it, the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 23, which says this, no Moabite 
to the 10th generation is allowed in the assembly of the Lord. They couldn't darken the doors of where God's presence was just because they're Moabites. Can you imagine being mad at someone for 10 generations? I mean, it's like telling somebody, hey, you can't come to my birthday party. Neither can your grandkids. Neither can your great grandkids. Don't invite your great great grandkids. Don't invite your great 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 grandkids either. None of them are welcome with us. And so when it comes to the story of the book of Ruth, nobody is expecting that a Moabite will be mentioned in God's word, let alone a Moabite woman taking the title of a book in the Old Testament, let alone this woman uh, becoming the great grandmother of King David, let alone uh, this family being mentioned in Matthew chapter one in the lineage and in the family tree of Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself. You wanna know what God is like? You ever wondered what our God is like God is the one who is finding those who've been excluded and bringing them in and including them to make sure they know they've got a seat at his table, which there's a message for us in that church. The church is not on earth to tell people all of the ways that they're wrong. The church is not here and present on planet earth so that we can correct and right all of the wrongs before somebody shows up and has a seat at the table. No, the church is here to declare that the whole world is invited to the table of God. This story begins in deep loss and pain and a complete mess. In a word, it's a dumpster fire. But again, as a reminder, the theologian Walter Brueggemann says that part of the prophetic task of the church is for us to learn to grieve in a world that just practices denial. 99% of churches, and I'm not hating on the church, Uh, I've given my life and my career to being a part of the local church. The world does enough to hate on the church. They don't need my help with it. But the majority of churches are great in teaching us how to read the Bible and how to pray and how to serve and how to go on a mission trip and and how to be a part of a, a local church body. But nobody's teaching us how to grieve. Here's what I know. And I know it because my soul care coach has had to, uh, to, to cram it into my mind and in my heart. What I know is you can't heal what you can't name. For so much of my life, I wouldn't even look at, let alone think about, let alone remind myself about some of the hard parts of my story. And, and, and hear me loud and clear, I had a great childhood. I have incredible parents who love Jesus and raised my brother and I to know the gospel and know Jesus. But I also carried a a hard and traumatic reality that led to some hard times in middle school and high school years. But something that I've learned over this past decade of regularly and consistently going to therapy is What I've learned is our losses, our pain, our trauma, our hurt needs to be witnessed. Somebody needs to see the pain that we've gone through and grieve with us. We gotta put it on the table and bring it out into the light and so help me God, this church is not here to practice denial and act like hard things don't happen in life. No, we're we're gonna be those who are learning how to grieve. We're gonna be a people who grieve with those who grieve, like the Apostle Paul says, grieve with those who grieve in Romans 12. Can I go further? Unprocessed grief in me, unprocessed grief in you, it doesn't just go away and disappear. It always just comes out sideways somewhere else. You ever thought like, man, why did I just say that? Why, Why did I just respond in that way. These are people that I love. Why did I I blow off of 
the handle with my kids like that. Have you ever wondered why somebody else did that? Whoa, where did that come from? Richard Rohr says that pain that doesn't get transformed gets transmitted. I've learned in myself, if I don't deal with my own grief, it doesn't just harm me, it harms my family. It harms my community because it doesn't just go away. And so if you can walk away with anything today, if you're, if you're carrying this burden of grief or hurt or pain or loss, just go to a therapist. Go get that help. There's nothing wrong with saying something's not right. Believe me, I've been doing this the past decade, every other week. Back to Ruth, this story begins in horror. But come back for the next three weeks because it's gonna end like a Hallmark movie. <laughs> I, I, I'm just telling you, we're not there today. Because these are two women who are gonna show us, teach us, train us, model for us what it looks like to take a deep, a journey in deep grief and loss and suffering. Verse six, then Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. The famine's over. They pack their bags in Moab and start to head back to Bethlehem. So all three of these widowed and destitute women start to go back to Bethlehem and Naomi, somewhere along the way, decides to change her mind. She tells her two daughters-in-law, hey, you know what? On second thought, you got, y'all, y'all need to go home. You don't need to come with me back to Bethlehem. Y'all are from Moab. Y'all go home. You're young. Find you a husband. Start your family. You don't have to go with me. There's still hope for you. Verse 12, jump down a little bit with me. Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, pause, some of your translations may say in verse 12, even if I thought there was still hope for me. Naomi's got no hope. She's got no finances, no family. Her economic situation is hopeless and helpless. There's nobody to protect or provide for her. Have you ever felt hopeless before? Like completely hopeless. Like you're in something and not sure you're gonna make it out. Kind of hopeless. This is where Naomi is. She's in so deep with grief without any sense of hope. So Orpah goes back, she heads back to Moab. Ruth sticks around with Naomi because to quote the great theologian, Ted Lasso, the only thing worse than being sad is being sad and alone. Listen, if we're gonna be the church that learns how to grieve in a world that lives in denial, we have got to learn like Ruth to stay when it's easier to leave. Y'all, we're in a culture of leavers. Is that a word? We're in a culture of people who at the, at the first sign of disagreement, whether it's politically, we're out. We're not doing Christmas together as a family anymore. We're leaving. At the first sign of, uh, of some mask mandate, whichever side you're on, you're like, hey, my church chose the wrong side. I'm out. We're in a culture and in a society, in a climate of leavers, and yet Ruth models for us, I ain't going anywhere. It's easier for Ruth to, to leave and, and go home, back to the people and the places that she knows and that she loves. She speaks the language. She knows the culture. But watch what Ruth does in verse 16. Ruth says this, don't urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I'll die, and there will I be buried. We gotta be like Ruth and, and, and stay when it's easier to just leave. I'm not suggesting that 
as soon as we wrap up the service, that you walk up to somebody new and say, where you go, I'll go. Where you live, I'll live. (laughs) That's not what I'm recommending this morning. But far too often, we think about the risks of saying yes to God, like, oh, gosh, if I fully obey what God wants me to do, what's gonna happen to my life? What's gonna happen to my relationships? What's gonna happen to my finances? Like, we think about the risk of saying yes to God, but rarely, if ever, do we think about the risk of saying no to God. Listen, don't miss what God is doing because you are so stuck on what you wish he was doing or you wish he'd done. We can miss so many open doors in our life because we're fixated on the closed doors in our life. We can miss so many people who are right in front of us because we're so fixated on the people who've left us. We can miss opportunities because we're stuck on lost opportunities. We can miss joy because we fixate on past sorrow. We can miss the good when we only fixate on the bad in our life. We can miss hope because we exclusively fixate on disappointment. Church, let's choose to fix our eyes and our focus on Jesus because he alone is the author and the finisher of our faith. Don't miss Jesus because of them or because of this or because of that. Ruth's one decision changed the course of the lineage of Jesus. I want to be like Ruth. I want to be that friend that knows pain and stays. One of my favorite authors, Henry Nouwen, appropriately pronounced, I love to say it this way, Henri, Henri Nouwen, says this, community is a fellowship of people who don't hide their joys and sorrows, but make them visible to each other in a gesture of hope. In community, we say that life is full of gains and losses, joys and sorrows, ups and downs, but we don't have to live it alone. I love how this little glimmer of hope, the first glimmer of hope in this story shows up in the fact that these two women get, excuse me, get to take the journey together to be comforted in the presence of each other. Yeah, they were going through it. Yeah, what they were going through was miserable, but watch this, verse 22. So so Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Isn't this beautiful evidence of God's grace, that they're together, that they made it to Bethlehem, just as the harvest is happening. You may be right in the middle of grief and loss and pain and hurt. You know, what I've experienced and what I've learned is that there's a moment to just sit in the grief and to actually be present in it, to actually feel the pain in the grief, not to rush too fast to this place of, yeah, 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 but God's working all things together for the good. Yeah, 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 it's terrible right now, but it's all, it's all good, it's fine. We aren't meant to deny our pain. We're not meant to excuse away our loss and our hurt. It needs to be processed so that it can be transformed by Jesus, so that we can be healthier humans for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for our church. A single mom in Chicago was quoted when she was going through an incredibly difficult time. She said this, hope is the active conviction that despair will not have the final word. We as followers of Jesus, practicing the way of Jesus, we have hope. Jesus took on flesh, came down to earth to enter our pain and offer us hope. So today I want us to close a little bit different. I'm gonna invite the prayer team up uh, to to be present and in the wings because maybe you're in the thick of the horror movie of your life. 
And there's no Hallmark movie in sight. Let me just encourage you and challenge you. I don't want you to rush out of it. Don't rush out of the hard. Don't rush out of the grief, out of the pain. Because as Brueggemann says, the prophetic task of the church is to tell the truth in a world living in illusion, to grieve in a world living in denial, to express hope in a world living in despair. Our prayer team is here. And listen to me, you don't have to get into all of it with them. You can just simply say, I'm hurting. You can just simply step up. You don't have to say anything. Maybe you can't even muster up enough to say, I want you to know you're in a safe space. You may be carrying unimaginable pain and hurt right now. Don't carry it alone. Don't try to figure it out alone. And so would you, would you come? Would you come and trust someone with the pain that you're carrying? Let's pray. Father, we, we're so glad that there's hope in hard times. We're so glad to know that regardless of what we're going through, we don't have to avoid it or walk around it, that you're with us in it. And so God, in this moment, in this place, in our hearts, would you so move that we just begin by saying, I need help. We trust you. We trust you with our life. We trust you with our grief. Help us as we navigate through it. In Jesus' name.